We IT nerds love to automate things. We love to script things. We love to make everything a process. We love to, uh, you know, anybody remember expect scripts? You know, I mean, I expect that many of you do. Everything should be automated, right? Right? Right, Justin? Should everything be automated? Um, well, I don't think I want to automate being a parent um, to my children uh, or, you know, looking after pets or indeed art because it's fun to do. I think that we as technologists, yeah, like you say, we like to automate things, but we we tend to forget that there are human beings currently doing the thing and we don't really think about the effect on them very much. And we should. Some things, yes, yeah, should be automated. There are some things which are incredibly tedious or dangerous and the people doing them lead terrible lives. And automation has allowed us to feed a lot more people than we ever could before. Um, it enables us to provide people with healthcare and clean drinking water and a whole bunch of really quite fundamental and transformative things that I think we forget when we get enamored of, of the technology stuff right in front of us. It. Like it's computers. It's like actually clean drinking water and flushing toilets are amazing. I'm but we should also be careful about how we do it and the transition from one to the other because sometimes it's going to put someone out of a job. And if we don't care about those people, they might not care very much about us. And if they are sitting around with no job and no food and no prospects and no hope, then maybe they'll come looking for the people who did that to them. Don't and maybe don't, they would be right to do so. Don't we just run into that over and over throughout history? Every time somebody automates some old job that somebody was doing manually, uh, there's Luddites, literally. That's where the term comes from. That's going to throw the contraption overboard because they don't want to be automated out of a job. But the rest of the world's like, no, we need to make progress as humanity. And this is something that we don't need humans to do anymore. And why should they when they could be doing something else more productive or more fulfilling? Man, you guys are really taking so this. I, I was going to say in the spirit. Yeah, I really want to grab that particular bit, partly because I really encourage people to read a book called The, uh, Social, uh, the Social Construction of Technology. So a great example there is numerical control machines. So CNC milling machines, um, which was originally numerical control milling machines, which was a, a factory thing where you're making parts. And physically that was done by machinists who were skilled artisans who worked in the shop and were in control of the shop and how the work was done. CNC milling machines enabled the control over the work to be taken away from the workers who were doing it and put somewhere else by managers who could then dictate to the workers exactly what they wanted to do. So when we talk about automation, I think we need to be very careful about who is in control of the automated system. Is it the same people that were doing it before? Or is it now someone else who gets to order other people around? And it's a choice about which way we do that. So one of the options around automating milling machines was we'll create templates or we'll, we'll get the people who run the machines to create the templates so that they can automate their own work. But we didn't do that. What we did was we built a different system that puts the control in the hands of a, a separate third party who aren't actually the people doing the work. And the end result of that was that the people who did the work either got fired, had no job, or got paid less. Well, and that's what generally we see happens is that when we, we separate the, the control over the work and the work being done, the people actually doing the work just get paid less. In the, in the spirit of Cloud Field Day, uh, let's ground this discussion a little bit in the cloud and think about automating in the cloud. And there's two things that I'm concerned about in terms of automation or lack thereof. Um, one is autom automating routine tasks enables your cloud employees to go and do stuff at, that provides greater value, which, and I can relate this back to, but I'm not going to, to the CNC example. The other part of automation and automating in the cloud is so much happens in the cloud so quickly that it is virtually impossible for humans to keep up with it and to keep up with the pace of business. And that's what's driving the desire to automate these tasks because we really don't want humans involved because of the mistakes they make and the, what impact that has on the business. And so I, I just want to add one other thing that goes back to what, what Ken brought up, and I think you're kind of touching on it a little bit as well, Justin, is, is the socio 
So one of the social changes that happened because of automation is that people that cannot afford certain resources are able to do things that we're not able to do before. For instance, within code automation, infrastructure as code, you have smaller teams that are able to build much larger solutions instead of having to sit there and figure out how to build them in very small click ops type fashion, going back to the idea of, of the wheel, right? Before you had pram and you had four people to pull it, but what if somebody wanted to pull a wagon? Wheels weren't involved, you wouldn't have something like that, like a technology. So there is those type of examples that do happen as well. All right, Jay. I have been recorded saying this before and I'll say it again. The rest of the world has things to do. Mm -hmm. And when I think of the progression in cloud, we've, we've gone from the blue screen of death to the purple screen of death, and now because of the wonders of cloud and automation, we can do the, 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 the rainbow screen of death. We can have all of it. Compute network storage, virtualization, orchestration, a whole shooting match can go sideways. But because of automation, our recover position is also accelerated. And so we have a far more, I would argue, recoverable uh, state that we can achieve so we can minimize the impact. But in order to achieve that, we have to let go of some of those manual things. What usually was blamed whenever we had a cloud outage? Network. Someone made a manual network change. It's DNS. It's DNS. It's always DNS. It's it's the haiku moment, right? And so the question is, do we want to progress and enable a far wider, a democratization of all this amazing technology, to your point, so that a much wider audience can get to it? But I think the, the fundamental element is, going back to the people part, is how would they ever participate if they're not upskilling into that direction? You know, if they're, if they're refining more advanced ways to do things the old-fashioned way manually, if we get them to embrace the automation, to upskill into the automation, I think it, I think it, pushes, the, 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 it pushes the societal element of cloud, you know, the cloud cloudorati, pushes them forward as well. So I think it, um, it, it means that as, as long as we bring people, give them a reason to be in the boat, number one, but once they're in the boat, we can all much, much safer in the boat than being in the rapids. So I, I, I kind of want to be the, the middle guy between uh, Justin and, 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 and Jay right now because I see both sides of the argument, right? I always think of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and I've been recorded bringing this analogy up. When you watch Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, what is the dad doing? He's screwing on the top of a toothpaste lid. That's his job. They get a robot that fixes, that, they will, that replaces him, and so he is out of a job. He skills himself up, learns how to fix the robot, and then gets a new job to, or to fix the robot. There is a process of progression that can be done for folks, but it, one of the reasons why I'm huge on being a delegate, huge on evangelizing tech and talking to all these different people about all these different solutions is because I want to help people skill up. The ability for people to get to the next level of automation, if they want to automate, IT or cloud, that's kind of the, the piece that tends to be just kind of assumed that that will happen. And so there's, there's, there's steps that need to happen there in order to help the skilling up. But I think we shouldn't just throw the baby out with the bathwater at the end of the day. Well, also to kind of bridge these two points as well, um, what, to Jason's... Or to, <laughs> I, I did it again, I'm sorry. <laughs> to Justin's point about uh, CNC machines, you know, we couldn't have most of modern society if not for CNC. We couldn't, I- individual artisans couldn't produce most of the things that we now know and love without automated production simply because they're too fine, they're too high volume, they would be priced out of our ability. They, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, technical reasons. It's the same for the cloud. We couldn't have the cloud without Terraform, without Ansible, without APIs, et cetera, because it simply could not happen. It's one of the, you know, one of the fundamental things. You can't take it out. You can't have it without that. And so although we can be sad at what we've lost, you know, we can be sad that um, artisans no longer make their own tools and their own jigs and take pride in their handwork. I personally am a little bit sad every time I run app get update upgrade, you know, dash Y, you know, on my on my machines, because I remember downloading source code and compiling and chasing down dependencies and figuring out how things installed 
and all that. And, and nobody does that anymore. Nobody. Okay. And, and yet but why, you also don't spend days doing it. Yes. Yeah. And, why and, would you yeah, get sad about but, but that? It, more specifically, one of our uh, other delegates who's not here ran, uh, when he was part of a storage campaign, ran a storage company, ran a campaign about the storage admin, the death of the storage admin, right? And storing is boring, right? It's the, the value to a company of paying uh, an IT admin salary to manage how much space you're consuming on your storage box when it can be replaced with, hey, expand storage automatically. If we're at 80%, go buy some more automatically from Amazon on a policy basis, set once and forget it, is huge to the company. And it allows, it enables that company to pay to upskill that worker to do other things that are more valuable to the company, right? We don't have an army of janitors running around our buildings anymore because we don't need to because they have enough automation skills to clean what they need to clean, right? And on and on and on. We can look at every aspect of our lives and every aspect of the cloud and every aspect of IT and technology that automation enables you to go up and higher. Yeah, but uh, I think you touch very important point that the janitors have right now the devices, the equipment to do that. You know. Um, like I said, six years ago, uh, there was not such a solution, right? And right now we have those solutions. So I think that automation will just come with the repatriation that we talked just for a second. Because the people just used to that. Yeah. You know? And they will use the models that they learn and reuse it in the infrastructure that they will build new. Because I don't believe that we will repatriate our uh, workloads or even create a new one in the old stack we will probably go for the new stack in some way. And the new stack means everybody IPA-driven, um, fully auto, possibly to full automation. All of this is here, out of the box. That's why it's much easier than it was back in the day. So, so this, um, this person can start from very beginning the new way. And I think it's going to be automation because... We can't stuff the genie back in the box. Yeah, I think people yeah. have gotten spoiled on it. And, and you know, I, I'm sure that the, that some of the people in some of the uh, much older and grayer people in Silicon Valley are saying this whippersnapper says that he misses the days of compiling source code. I miss the days of writing source code. You know, I miss the days of writing my own device driver for this new piece of hardware. You know, and, and, it, and, it, and it builds and it builds and it builds. And, and so, Justin... Um, I think that you do have a point, though, that there is a, a bit of dignity. And frankly, there's a lot of understanding that gets lost as well when things are automated. Um, you know, nobody really yeah. knows these systems anymore. Yeah, and it's, I, I think I need to clarify that I'm not against automation. It's more about who gets to decide what gets automated and how. And I think that we, I mean, even the conversation that we're having in the room is a little bit we're talking about other people as if they're not real and they don't have opinions and aren't actually involved. I mean, tech loves to talk about democratizing things, but how many people get to vote on whether or not this thing will happen? Like companies and corporations are not democracies. They're fascist dictatorships, quite frankly. There is one person in charge and they get to dictate what everybody else does. Unless that changes, then what we're talking about is actually dictating to other people. And it's like, no, you will change on my time schedule and the way that I decide that you will do it. And it's like, well, do we have to do it that way? What if we didn't do it that way? What if we allowed ourselves to automate stuff in a slightly different way? What if it was a choice of like, you know what? Sometimes I do it this way because it's fun. Um, sometimes I have a different objective. And I'm doing this because actually I, I need this product to get out because. I want more people to be able to buy this stuff. And, I, and it would be great if we made this cheaper so that more people could have shoes. So I will find a way to be able to produce that more quickly and, and easier, but I'll do it rather than being told to do it by somebody else. So, so I'm, I'm going to jump in there because uh, you, you hit on something that is true in my life because one of my positions was to be an automation specialist. And I was told to was, specifically by my, my boss, I want you to automate the creation of virtual machines and I want to make this process easier and I want to build this. I said, okay. So I started week one, week two, week three, you know, was able to get things moving. And then I started hearing all these things from the developers and the people on the other side, which my boss had nothing to do with those guys. But they talked about the biggest things that they had to deal with is the amount of tickets that were in the queue. 
I had, they had a constant 100 to 120 tickets on a four-man crew, right? So I think what you're saying is absolutely true. And in, in, in a pe period of, of my experience was I changed what needed to be automated. And I told my boss, give me a week to automate just three of these things. It didn't take that long. And I was able to drop the ticket queue from 110 week after week to by the time I was, I was done, it was down to about uh, 10. So, I mean, and, and it drastically changed the, the experience of those four guys that were there because they were able to just start doing automation, uh, not automation, they were start, able to start using it in order to fulfill ticket requests and things of that nature that they were doing. And the developers were happy because they were getting what they needed to do and the support teams because they were getting what they needed to do. So it just became this dramatic cultural shift. Um, but I think we could say that for automation and I think we could say that for other technologies. I think we're overrating here the decision of the, of the high management regarding automation. I think it's going bottom up very often, like you said, you know, like the people who just know the tools, they start to use it to make their life easier. Of course, if it's a support from the high management, it's great, right? But I don't, I don't believe personally in these programs in big corporation to change everything by one movement, you know, and everybody jumps on the train. If the people doesn't believe it, they will never do it, right? So, like you said in your example of your, of your exper experience, you did it and the management agree with you. And I think with automation, the new way of automation, of the new way of infrastructure on-prem that we will have, it's going to be really the same. So the people, local people who manage that will just came out of the box with that. And if the management will be, okay, I like it, and then put it in the program. Not way around like, yeah, we'll go automation first. Come on. Mm. Automation first, we'll finish like cloud first. You know? Yeah, exactly. We just had the conversation about that. You're literally playing back almost the exact same A-B test, minimum viable product, pilot story of AI and ML that's happening in enterprise right now. And it does sound like so the, people would call it robotic process automation. They give a different extreme automation. And now there's, you know, we're going to put a machine learning model on top of it. And they've been doing that for many years, but now it's got AI. And so it made me think of like, if it was additive manufacturing, maybe it's a cobot, not a robot. If it's, you know, code being written, it's like that project wisdom for Ansible that we talked about before. Maybe that's, a co-pilotish way of doing your Ansible, marginally more, you know, maintainable than if you had taken it down your, you know, your particular idea, because you're thinking of more than just yourself. You're thinking in terms of, Stephen has to follow behind me. And while Stephen might write a device driver, he didn't necessarily know what I had in mind when I did my Ansible this way. And so there, there's probably, um, ways to bring automation in and I would argue that the conversation we just had is probably a bit much for a leader um, mm -hmm. they're probably held to a different set of KPIs they're probably you know the reason you were brought in to deal with the VM thing is because you probably had a big dashboard that said hmm VM problem fix problem didn't have anything that looked at maybe ticket queues for the developers and because you said that's a different group right different, mm -hmm. different internal customer but uh, you were operating at the grassroots level, which goes back to what you were saying. So have, have we really, have we arrived at that for automation? Um, if there is a control plane, it's who actually, who actually drives that control plane? Mm -hmm. Is that really what we should be asking? And that gets to Justin's point again. It took us a while, Justin, but we came to your side. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not sure I'm there yet, but, <laughs> but I will say that. Well, Fox would say it's inevitable, but uh, yeah. But, but one I think I think that, yeah, the humans, we, we, like technology is great. Humans are better. And I, I think we should probably leave more space for the humans. Well, I, um, we're I, far more creative. I think we all agree that we're going to do, make horrible decisions. We're going to use AI to create these amazing techno, technological things that will take away everybody's job. And then AI will become, you know, this god above everyone. And I, for one, accept our AI robot overlords. And so I look forward to serving them one day. You'll be repairing their subsystems. Yeah. yeah. Well, I will point out that automation is certainly not without peril. Uh, most automated systems are extremely fragile. Most automated systems have very little quality control or quality assurance. Basically, they just assume they're going to do it right. 
And when they don't, everything falls apart. And I think all of us have experienced that with, uh, you know, all of the, uh, you know, the Terraform and uh, that, that we've used. And, you know, what happens when you when you uh, you hit it and it doesn't do the thing? You know, what happens when Ansible comes back with an error? Well, that's a fun day. Um, wow. So, so Justin had a good point that I agree with. And, and I think that it's, you know, couched in different language. Part of it is about what gets automated and making sure that you're doing the right things. And that's where the human element comes in. It reminds me that, you know, many, many, many moons ago when I did my uh, MBA, there was a very popular business book at the time called Reengineering the Corporation. And it was very popular. It was all about, you know, it's one of these, you know, the next bandwagon that everybody was on. When you actually figured out what they were talking about, it was, uh, uh, you know, reengineering the corporation was about fixing the automation people had put in that was simply duplicating the human process. And it started with looking at a bank. And so they automated the mortgage, the process of doing a mortgage application in a bank. And when you did it manually, you had a secretary type up the application and she would type up five different copies because there would always be typos and would need five different people to review it to make sure everything was correct. And so when they started, the bank started automating that and putting it in computers, they still had the five people doing the sign-offs on it, but there are no typos in it. Once you created the, first, the document the first time and somebody, you know, there's, there's the possibility for the mistakes that they were checking for aren't there, so they didn't need that level of automation. They needed something else instead. And so re-engineering was all about finding all the stuff that we automated wrong at the time and fixing it. And the, the, that QA part that you bring up is, I don't think a bank has ever made a mistake, right? They, you know, their math is infallible. Um, you know, they're omnipotent, omniscient, et cetera, right? So that QA component, that the human in the loop, H-I-T-L, is an essential piece of this. And so that's another thing too is, is there a protection pattern that is best practice so that when you do unleash, and you will be unleashing automation, when you do unleash the automation, where is, what's the center of the QA? What is, who is the arbiter of, yep, ran exactly the way I thought it was. And do those, those people become like Maytag repair people? Yeah, and it's, and it's true what uh, Justin said at the top there as well, that people are very good at saying, wait, 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 that machine's not supposed to be punching a hole clear through this piece. Something's wrong here and pressing the stop button. But without that human in the loop, it's going to punch all those holes that it possibly can because that's just what it does. It's designed to punch holes, you know? We can talk about automation and how much we love automation over and over and over again until you have to actually run an automation script to the main production Active Directory in order to change the GPO or add users, and you will... Definitely look at that script 50 bazillion times, and then you're probably going to say, you know what, I know how to do this by hand. I should probably just do it that way. Because at the end of the day, you don't know if that script has one thing wrong that just messes up the entire forest and you have to rebuild. And that is the last thing you want to do. Yeah, and businesses, I guarantee you, are not going to be in a rush to automate their accounts receivable processes uh, with no human oversight, because uh, there's going to come a time when somebody's going to say, wait a second, what if we don't get paid? Yep. And then that'll be the end of that. Or in well, I don't know. I, I bet you that it, there'll be a couple who do it, but they'll only do it once. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, automation is inevitable, um, but with great power comes great great peril. Great so, repatriation. Yes, great repatriation. So thank you very much for this, uh, this, this talk. And Justin, thank you for reminding us of the, the greater picture of, uh, of the peril of our technologies.